The Gospel of Mark is a, the, a different gospel, we might say, to the other gospels of uh, Matthew and Luke, and a different gospel, really, from John that's different from the other three. It's the shortest gospel, and uh, in that it comes with its own unique way of telling the story of Jesus Christ and the good news. Very interesting, if you look at the uh, amount of space that uh, Mark takes up, you see, compared with the, the baptism of Jesus, it's quite short. Uh, when you go on to the temptation of Jesus, it's even shorter. And uh, we often wonder why this is so. I think very much there's the sense that Mark's gospel is targeting Christians very shortly after the, the death of Jesus Christ. And John wants to get on with the main story. It's not that these two instances are unimportant, but John wants to emphasise that these two events took place and he's leaving others to fill in the details. So it's quite important the way that Mark does it. It's the earliest gospel written. It was written by John Mark, who... Uh, we believe was a sort of almost a adopted son of Peter. We know that in very much of the way the Gospel's written, he was obviously a, an eyewitness to some of the events. And uh, he accompanied Peter on many of his travels and was often called Peter's interpreter. So he had a first-hand experience, although he wasn't one of the disciples, he had a first-hand experience of Jesus' ministry. And I think it's always good, if you're buying a Bible or you're looking up a translation on, uh, on, on the internet or uh, digitally, you need really, in many respects, I think, to find a translation that references Mark's Gospel with the other Gospels. Because I think it's like as you're reading, you're studying Mark, you come to the Temptations, two verses, and that's enough. And it's always good to reference it against the other Gospels. And see, and ask yourself the question, why has Mark said this, and why has another Gospel writer said that? So that's what we're going to have a look in these next few weeks as we pick out some particular events that Mark homes in on. Very much the so we can say Mark's account at the beginning of Jesus' ministry really is enough to make sure we understand that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. I think that's why I love that song we sung, Meet This a Majesty. It really portrays the fact that we need to understand one of the basic beliefs of Christianity, that Jesus was both fully man and fully God. And we recognise that lots of the cults around Christianity cannot accept that fact. They don't believe that. They just believe that Jesus was a special, ordinary person born, and somehow God made him a son of God, adopted him. And that's not what the Christian Gospel portrays. The Christian Gospel portrays fully that he is man and he is God. And in, that is the only way we can understand his mission and how he saves us. So the first event we've got in 
Mark's Gospel is the fact that Jesus was baptised. John the Baptist was baptising people in the, in the desert around the Jordan River, uh, creating a good amount of uh, stir up amongst the establishment of Jerusalem and the leadership of the Jewish people, the Romans and the, the Jews, equally as much. Because he was basically saying that uh, you've got it all wrong. You need to recognise that you are sinful people and you need to worship God from that angle. Many of the Jewish people at the time were proud people and believed they could earn their seat in the kingdom of God. And John came along saying, you've got it all wrong. And this was causing a great stir in the community that was picked up not only amongst the Jewish leaders, but also the Roman authorities and was causing trouble. And we have to remember <coughs> very much that Jesus recognised that John the Baptist, as he was locally called, was one of the most important prophets of that period. And he had a big following. And he was preaching that there was one coming after him who was going to be the Messiah which he describes of the, he wasn't even, I sh, he, sh, he shouldn't even allow him to tie up my shoelaces. But Jesus comes to John on the Jordan and wants to identify with ordinary people. Because of his humanness, he recognised too that he needs to be baptised. And he comes to John and persuades him to be baptised. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice, from, voice came from heaven saying you are my son whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Now that uh, clip from the DVD, the Bible, doesn't actually show that voice. And I think really we need to understand that as way the, the director and the writers of that uh, film recognise in a sense it was only John and Jesus who heard the voice of God in that circumstance. It wasn't the rest of the crowd. And it was said to John and to Jesus particularly that God was definitely establishing the identity of Jesus, his beloved son. It was something for those two human beings at that time to have confirmation of what they were doing. That Jesus was beginning his ministry and John was indeed had been part of the prophet proclaiming that the Messiah was coming. They both, in many ways, needed to do that. So Jesus is baptised. Jesus comes from north of, to the river Jordan and is baptised with John. He has no sin to be washed away, but he joins with all those who are turning to God. He comes out of the water, he sees heaven open and the Holy Spirit descending on him. The spirit has the gentleness and purity of a dove fluttering down and settling on Jesus. And a voice from heaven says, you are my son, whom I love. It may be that only Jesus sees the spirit and hears the voice, but we are let in on one great secret. The son of God is preparing this mission. I think that's very interesting, isn't it? I can imagine... Jesus has been waiting 
for this day when his ministry was going to be. It's very interesting, the couple of films we've looked at over the summer, haven't we? The Young Messiah and Ben-Hur. There's an element within those films of Jesus touching at that sort of ministry he was going to proclaim, but it hadn't yet become his time. And uh, you can imagine that Jesus, you know, by this time he's 30. You know, how long had he been champing at the bit to get going? But of course he was always going to be waiting on his father to give him the word. And I think this is what John, uh, Mark's gospel gives us that entirety. He doesn't want to mess about with the beginnings of Jesus' ministry. He wants to get right in it. As Jesus, I'm sure, wanted to start on his ministry to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven was coming. And Mark tells us that at once the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is, sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. Quite short and distinct. But he gets the basic message in. He was going to get going. He was going into the desert. He needed to be prepared. The last thing he needed to be prepared for was the final attack on his mission by Satan. And off he goes. The temptation of Jesus. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. Mark's Gospel could be translated in that. It led him into the desert. None of the others are very much into the wilderness. But in many of the translations of Mark, it talks about desert. Of course, the desert is one of the Bible's most important places, isn't it? And so are 40 days, and we haven't got time to go into that. But I think we need to see the fact that this 40-day period in the wilderness represents for Jesus a bad time in his life that is imposed by Satan. And often when we go through periods of difficulty or illness, it's imposed by others too. So Jesus, in that sense, has been there before us. He's been there. And Mark certainly wants to include this event and wants to include that he endured all that was thrown at him in the desert. The good news is that Jesus faced the sort of temptations that we faced. He overcame the temptations that came his way. And in him overcoming them, he's encouraging us too to overcome the difficulties and the temptations that come along our path's way. And we can know, with the help of the Holy Spirit, that we can overcome, just as Jesus overcame the temptations he had through the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led in this direction. And the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews says this, he who had to be one of us so that he could serve God as our merciful and faithful high priest and sacrifice himself for the forgiveness of our sins. And now that Jesus has suffered and was tempted, he can help anyone else who is tempted. The scriptures recalled later in the New Testament that he had to be done. It had to be something that he had to endure. The purpose demonstrates that Jesus was sinless and was therefore qualified to die as our substitute. To die on our behalf as God's appointed saviour. 
And in one sense, I think Jesus really did need to go through this wilderness experience for these 40 days to prepare him for all that was going to happen and the difficulty of what he needed to remain faithful to in the months ahead. The Spirit led him. It led him because his calling as the Son of God, as a servant to humankind, has to be worked out in the face of opposition. His death and sacrifice would mean less unless he faced the sort of opposition we face in our life journeys. He was, if you like, in all points, tempted like we are, yet he remains sin, without sin, and he encourages us to step out on that path and to resist temptation when it comes. The temptation that Jesus had, I think specifically, is the, that he shouldn't short circuit the purposes of God. That was always temptation. He could have avoided this wilderness period. He could avoided the cross and tried to short circuit the salvation of the world. But he didn't. He went through it according to God's plan. Our battle with sin and evil reflects his. They might be slightly significant. We're not going to go into wilderness or desert situations, but we're going to be in things that seem and can be paralleled with the wilderness in our lives. And I think we need to prepare ourselves for it. The first thing Jesus tested on, there were three things, or people often argue about, well, are there three or four temptations? There are actually three temptations, three specific things that Satan tempts him about, but there's also a fourth temptation in each of them, and that is that wonderful little word, if. The first thing Satan says to him is, if you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. He wants to really challenge him as if Jesus really believes that he's God's son. He wants to put doubt in his mind. And this is very much so for us as well. How often do we hesitate over whether we're truly saved, whether we're really going to go to heaven, whether our sins have been forgiven? There is that temptation, but no matter how much and how often we hear uh, about the promises of God and the fact that if we give our lives to, to Christ, then all will be forgiven and we will be part of his kingdom. But it often comes out when we go in tough situations that we start to doubt that. Who are we in Christ? Remember we did that series earlier on last year on that subject because I think it's one of the important things is we can, when we're having a rough time, we can doubt who we are in Christ. And Satan puts this into this temptation. If you are the Son of God. And that's repeated in all the temptations, isn't it? I like this poem. If, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blame it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting. Or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk 
two wives. Anybody you know who says that? By a famous English writer? Well done. Partly. I've only read one verse there. You might have recognised some other the other verses. But Rajan Kukin, if is a great word in the English language, isn't it? If, if this, if that. And Satan here. He's trying to get Jesus to doubt his messiahship, doubt his mission. And in many ways, he's doing that. Because the first temptation very much, isn't it? It's the fact that uh, Jesus' temptation in the desert were targeted at the very heart of his mission. And uh, that's what Satan knew. Satan must have known that he was about to commence it and was keen on trying to destroy it. The first temptation, of course, is turn this stone into bread. Jesus, of course, must have been hungry. And Jesus, Satan is trying to get him to turn the stones into bread, believing that he cannot sustain this period in the wilderness, this period of fasting, this period in the heat. And how often do we struggle with thinking that God is not providing for us, that uh, we haven't got enough of money or anything. It's one of those main things that uh, we come across, isn't it? That uh, we believe that we need to take our own actions sometimes that may not be good actions because things are not developing. But of course the truth is that God will all provide for us all our needs. Secondly, the devil said to him, throw yourself off this cliff or whatever. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, I give you all the, the authority and splendour it has been given to me and I can give to anyone I want. If you worship me, it will be yours. This is Luke's account we're reading from of the, of the temptations in the desert and I like the way that film dealt with that, of the devil trying to say to Jesus, well, look, all these people that are going to cause your problems, I could get them to worship you if you worship me. And of course, Jesus comes back at him again with another piece of scripture. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Thirdly, the devil led him up to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift, up, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Here's the devil quoting scripture at Jesus and its words from Psalm 90. Jesus answered him, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus reminded him that Satan was misinterpreting scripture. Three temptations that he had to deal with in the desert. Temptations that Jesus was being tested by Satan himself. Satan knew possibly that these were three weaknesses that Jesus had to contend with. And when we're being tempted, 
we must remember that the Satan knows where our weaknesses are and we must guard against them. If we look at uh, these temptations, the first one really is to doubt God's provision. The second one is to doubt God's protection. And the third one is to doubt the promises that God has made to us. So what these are all very in line very much with the sort of temptations that we will be up against in our lives. Selwyn Hughes, I don't know how many of you remember Selwyn Hughes. Do you remember Selwyn Hughes? He uh, describes temptations in this sort of order. The three channels of temptation are lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh preys on our physical appetites and their gratifications in this world. The lust of the eyes appeal to self-interest and tests the word of God. The pride of life stresses self-promotion and self-exaltation. Satan confronted both the first Adam and the last Adam through each of these three channels of temptation. Lust of the flesh, lust of the body, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's one way of looking at that. It, that gives it a slightly different angle that may help us to understand what is going on. But whatever it is, temptations are to be expected in life, in the Christian life too. They are ex to be expected and that we are to experience them. The temptations in your life are no different from the others experienced and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. Where you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. That's what Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth. It's not a sin to be tempted and no temptation is irresistible but they're going to be part of our Christian life. We are unlikely to avoid temptation not just once but maybe several times through our lives and we must be on guard of it. John Stock reminds us very much that temptations are to be resisted but in a sense these trials that come upon us are to be welcomed because in very much it endures us, encourages us, develops our character and we must remember that, that uh, testing is good. As the kids go back to school they will be tested in and through various times in their school. It's one of the ways we grow, isn't it? It may be inconvenient to be tested, but it's the only way that we know if we are learning. And it's the same side in Christian life when we resist these temptations and uh, are being tested in that sense so we can gain and know and gain assurance for the times that we get through them. One word of warning to finish with this. We must never believe that we are now so secure in our faith or mature in our faith to believe that no temptation is ever going to harm us. That's a dangerous belief. I've known it through several people I've been close to over the years who've had that thought and ne would never be believe that they would be seduced by temptation. But they have. And some unbelievable people that I believed would never succumb to temptation. But it is possible. And I think if we get into that thing we say well we're clear now we're fine we're going to resist anything that the devil 
can throw against us. We've got to remember that devil is a cunning fellow. He's a master of deception. And we can get led completely the wrong way and not realise it too, it's too late. And it can be, well, I know many people lose careers over it. So we must always remember that. But let's have some good bits of scripture to remind us the good things about temptation. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, says James. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each of you is tempted when you are dragged away by your own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. Very important words that we need to remember to finish this first session on Mark's Gospel. We'll come back uh, next week and look at healing uh, and how Mark deals with healing in his Gospel.